sorry. <laughs> all right, sure. Uh, so, so if you notice, uh, they all need to have uh, high-speed data communication. And at the same time, many of these applications require low power. So this is a balance, or I would say a challenge. You, you, you would look at the high-speed data communication, and you would say, oh, this is a very high-power design. And at the same time, you need low power for your communication devices. And that brings us uh, to this idea. I, I think in the long term, this is my vision, that we have to bring all of these uh, devices on chip on a different platform. doesn't have to be a platform that we know right now, but it has to support all of the devices that we know in terms of the sensors, the CMOS devices, and also needs to be supported with some cognitive learning and uh, you know AI algorithms so we can uh, enhance the network further and be able to penetrate deeper into various levels of the applications that we have. Now, I will go into details in, in more, but let's just look, look back and look at the problems that we have in this design. Um, I'll be talking about two basic thrust research areas that I've been focusing on. One is the high-speed data communication, and I would like to call it efficient data communication because you can always do high-speed data communication, but what's important is you need to be doing it at low power and efficiently. So there are various uh, obstacles uh, that I'll be discussing here in terms of both getting the bandwidth and also the frequency references and the temperature stability. I will also go into the ultra low power communications. That's what I'm currently doing at Qualcomm. And that's very exciting because it has uh, various applications in biosensors and, and uh, in, uh, in uh, sensor interface. Uh, it also has uh, uh, newer applications in uh, cognitive learning. All right, so ultra high speed data communication, obviously everyone knows, I mean, that there are many examples of uh, these uh, very fast communication networks. You have internet, you have, uh, you know, supercomputing, you have cloud computing, you have high speed data communications uh, all over the place, both short range and long range. Uh, and you also have, uh, you know, what you call data transfer over mobile, which is becoming hot these days. All of these uh, share one important aspect, and that is a very high data rate, but they have to do it in, uh, in with, with dissipating as little energy as possible. Um, now, um, the challenge here is, well, when you try to extend the data rate higher and push to higher and higher data rate, uh, you immediately see two problems. Uh, some of these techniques that we're working on, I'm actually showing an example of what we actually see in real life. As you push toward higher data rates, uh, some of the techniques that you're working on the RF, it actually diminishes. Uh, uh, it becomes kind of inefficient because you, at some point, run into non-idealities of a device and, uh, or the technology that you're working on. So these techniques are not able to, uh, to keep up with the data rate. In a sense, you will see a knee in your curve. And that same thing also happens with the range, OK? So your l range gets limited because the channel that you're interfacing or, or you're using for sending this data has its own non-idealities. For example, fiber has its own chromatic loss. Or if you are working in, in uh, you know, free space, then uh, you will have the, you know, the distance to be your, uh, your enemy here. Uh, so what we need is we need to do some sort of you know, smart equalization uh, in order to improve our performance without burning a lot of power. Um, well, this is something that we have been done before, and you might say, oh, this is something that other people have looked at it, but not for this high data rate and not in trying to combine a very high data rate over a long range uh, of operations. So in, in our solution, uh, we thought that if we have an adaptive equalizer and a transceiver, which works at a lower data rate, but there are multiple channels. So we can have the same data rate, but you know, spread over multiple channels, then we'll be able to have uh, the objective of this, which is a higher um, efficiency uh, data communication. So we call this adaptive parallel optical transceiver, OK? Um, this is a block diagram of what I mean. Uh, you might ask, OK, so what will happen before and after this transmitter. This is just the silicon area, or you would call it electronics part. Uh, the actual um, serial to parallel conversion, 
uh, is a very important and challenging part, but that's done in optical domain. And for these data rates, we have enough bandwidth uh, in optical domain, so we can actually do that uh, to get uh, even a terabit per second spread into multiple channels. Uh, in this design, uh, on the uh, on the circuit side, each channel can be separately and independently optimized to give us the optimum performance with the power that we want. Uh, we have our equalizers, we have our drivers, both on the receiver side and the transmitter side. Uh, we can even have our clock data recovery. This solution was intended for a wireline application, but the concept can actually apply to other type of uh, high-speed data communication networks that you have. Okay. Now, for the equalizers, a lot of these equalizers that we use, actually they uh, need to be uh, using the information which is contained within the amplitude of the signal. That means that the amplitude, that, that means that a lot of these uh, signals coming out of the drivers have to have a precise amplitude and it has to be linear. Uh, that brings us uh, to our, I would say, most important challenge is how we can control the amplitude over a broadband design. Uh, let's revisit that. If you have an amplifier, this is a very simple amplifier. You put, out, uh, put in a signal at the input, and if this amplifier is ideal, it will amplify that and it will give you an output which is amplified. Now, but uh, this is not good because we want to control the output amplitude based on the information that we have. We don't want this to exceed a certain limit, right? So in order to do that, you can have, a, you can have some sort of a feedback. Right? A feedback is a very typical way of actually controlling uh, the signal at the output. You can actually sample the output and uh, see what's the input signal and based on that adjust your gain. In, uh, this is a very you know, standard way of gain adjustment and you can see that in the gain, for example, these are just uh, hypothetical numbers. If you have a 25 dB gain from an amplifier, if you add feedback to it, you can drop this gain to, let's say, by 10 dB to 15 dB. Uh, fine, it works. but. Uh, uh, the real cases are not like that. In real cases, in amplifiers, you have bandwidth limitation. You have, in your frequency response, you have poles and zeros. So when you try to actually reduce the bandwidth, uh, I'm sorry, when you try to reduce the gain, the bandwidth gets affected. You actually see peaking in the performance, and that peaking is because of the kind of pole and zero transfer functions that you have, okay? Well, uh, this is unwanted, obviously, and uh, we need to avoid that. Uh, we found some clever techniques uh, to do an amplitude correction and at the same time adjust the bandwidth. So we have one loop that does the amplitude control and at the same time does the frequency control. When we don't need the extra bandwidth that you see here, we will adjust that and we get this new curve that has reduced peaking or in ideal case, we'll have no peaking, okay? With that in mind, this is a prototype that we came up with uh, at, uh, at Broadcom. Uh, and this is a very simple design of a trans impedance amplifier that works up to 25 gigabits per second. It has three sections. The first section is, is a trans impedance amplifier, followed by uh, two stages of gain and, uh, and the buffer. Uh, what you see on the bottom is what I want to emphasize is actually the automatic gain control loop. This automatic gain control loop not only adjusts the gain of these amplifiers, but also has additional component that adjusts the bandwidth. So, uh, so this was uh, done uh, at 25 gig, and we were able to demonstrate a 25 gigabit I very easy uh, with a wide dynamic range of almost uh, 7 dB power. Uh, and at the same time, we put this in a 12-channel design, and we got a 300 gigabit data transferred over short reach. This, these were short reach channels, less than 100 meters, uh, which was impressive at the time. You can see that the, the I on the left side is at minus 7 dBm. The I at the right side is at 0 dBm. Same amplitude, roughly the same jitter. I don't have the markers here, but you can see it's roughly the same jitter, the same I uh, closure. This is a part of the work that we did. Uh, uh, but that's just not the only part. Okay, so you solve the problem with the amplitude and also the gain. Now, there are other components. Going back into this uh, design, I would like to emphasize that there are more components here. One of them is a CDR, is a clock and data recovery, and that needs a reference, right? So 
for a reference, you need to have a very high uh, accurate uh, and low jitter reference. Uh, but before we do that, let's figure out why, what do we mean by low jitter references. If you have an ideal oscillator, the output will look like this. Okay? Let's say this is in a square wave. It could be a sinusoid. right? But in real cases, uh, there is uncertainty around this transition. And that is actually called jitter. So in real cases, you have jitter. You want to minimize this jitter, right? So you want low jitter because this uncertainty is bad. It's going to add phase noise to your system. And it, it, it actually adds uh, uncertainty to the clock, right? So you want low jitter references. The current solutions uh, actually use uh, bulky off-chip crystals. Um, well, for some applications, this is good, but for Performance, uh, for high performance applications, this is problematic. For one, it's off chip, and the other thing is it's low frequency. I'll get to low frequency in just a bit, but even the off chip part is going to be a problem because we are trying to integrate everything, right? The on chip alternative is to use some sort of a CMOS compatible design. This is a CMOS compatible gigahertz MEMS resonator, which uh, we'll go through this in this uh, presentation. Uh, if you do this kind of design as opposed to a low frequency, less than 100 megahertz, you get an advantage of over a decade improvement in the frequency. At the same time, you can have your low jitter MEMS oscillator. So this is another important portion of high performance uh, uh, systems, high data rate systems that we are diving into. Okay, now why do we need high frequency? Some people say, okay, do the design at low frequency and you probably have easier time and lower cost. But high frequency is needed because of the 5G and 4G OFDM systems. They have very tight phase noise spec. Let's say you start with a 10 megahertz clock. If you up convert it to the frequency of interest, which is multiple, uh, multi gigahertz, then this is your up converted phase noise. This is the degradation you have. But the spec is here. So you actually have to put a lot of strain on your PLL loop filter. And that loop filter now has to be bulky because your devices are bigger, the passives are bigger. Uh, this is something we want to avoid. These are all toxic for integration, right? Um, so the solution is to reduce the smaller, uh, to reduce the up conversion ratio. Let's say have this curve appear here, and that arrives us at the higher frequency resonators. Okay. Now let's look at different type of resonators. This is general type of resonators. You can apply them to MEMS resonators or other type of resonators, but generally the resonators are either excited uh, and, uh, and the transduction either appears at, in a thickness mode or in lateral mode. In thickness devices, the frequency is determined by the thickness of the device and uh, the way it propagates on the thickness that determines the resonance frequency. Unfortunately, you can only have one frequency with a fill. Uh, and that's predetermined. On the lateral mode resonators, the actuation and also the transduction is done on, on laterally. So you can potentially have multiple frequencies on the same chip using the same film. And uh, this is the choice that we have for this particular design because uh, for many systems, you need multiple references with different frequencies. This, this is obviously not possible with a thickness mode design. So we chose a lateral mode resonator. This is a conceptual block diagram of an oscillator. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it in, in your courses. When you have an oscillator, uh, it has two parts. To have a Barkaz's criteria met, you need to somehow cancel the loss that you have in your resonating tank, and you also need to uh, meet the phase uh, margin across the loop. Uh, for this, we have a TIA. The TIA needs to be high power. Why do we need a TIA? Because the output from this device is actually current, and then you need to give it a boost, and then you need to deliver this a voltage. This is a series resonant uh, tank that I'm, uh, and that will just get to it in a bit. Uh, so we need a high gain design uh, and an amplifier, right? What are the more important issues other than just the gain and the bandwidth? Uh, I have listed this here. The noise characteristic is very important. You're trying to create uh, an oscillator that has inherently low noise. So, and this is actually the noise that's going to be amplified inside this uh, tank and gets filtered. So you, you need to have a low noise uh, design. And of course, you need to have a large output swing because you need to drive your devices, right? This is the same resonator. We actually use this. And uh, if you look at the amplifiers, you will see that, oh, so I have a design, but it's not low power. I am able to get the bandwidth, uh, but I'm not able to get the gain. 
here's where we talk about the trade-off. Okay, what are the trade-offs here? You need to have certain amount of gain and you need to have certain amount of bandwidth. Uh, usually these two don't go together, right? Uh, I've listed multiple ways that you can get gain in traditional circuit designs, analog circuit designs. You can improve the gain by using CAS codes, you can have current amplifications. I've also listed you know, typical bandwidth in, in enhancement techniques. You can use feedbacks, some pole cancellations, GM boosting, right? Uh, but if you want to just use one of these approach, uh, then you will end up hurting the other one. Let's say you pick the CAS code, you end up losing the bandwidth and vice versa. So what did we do? Uh, the challenge is actually simultaneous gain and bandwidth enhancement is very difficult. We mix and match. Um, uh, at first, I thought this was not possible, but when I was actually diving into this, I, I figured this is actually very possible. So I chose a current amplifier, which was not very, uh, I would say, um, conventional at the time, and combined that with cascade of you know voltage amplifiers and some pole cancellation techniques with feedback. So I got a TIA with a current preamplifier. In this design, this is what we published in ISSC in 2010. Uh, we have some, dis some, some uh, current amplifier. This is like a simple current meter, but we added feedback to it. So the, the amplifier, this current amplifier, which is a simple current meter, now has a larger bandwidth. So the input uh, impedance is now uh, lowered by additional gain of this feedback system, right? At the same time, I'm actually shooting uh, two birds with one stone. I'm uh, I'm actually flowing the same current into resistor and generate the voltage here, right? So I don't have to actually have another stage to generate the voltage. I come here, outside, the current is boosted, and then it's passed through a resistor, now I have a voltage. I gain it up as much as I need, so I have voltage gain stages with feedback, and this feedback is a special feedback, it's got uh, some zero for bandwidth enhancement, and then find dr final driver for driving a 50 ohm design. Uh, this was uh, apparently, uh, at the time, as far as I know, was uh, the highest frequency MEMS resonator you can see on the left. We did a two-chip solution at the time, but our resonator was CMOS compatible. If we had enough money, then we would be able to actually do it on chip. Uh, we got a one gigahertz uh, oscillator with a very, you know, decent phase noise around minus 95 dBc per hertz at one kilohertz offset, which was, uh, I think at the time, was the highest uh, uh, FOM oscillator, I think it still has. Um, if I compare it with other type of designs that other people do, I think it's still the highest uh, FOM to date for the MEMS resonators. Um, okay, so that solved the problem of going higher frequency, but is that enough? No, because um, you cannot have a free running resonator or a free running oscillator. You need to have an oscillator and a reference which is stable, right? Uh, so uh, there are there are two different topics, long-term stability and uh, short-term stability. I don't dive into long-term stability because that has to do a lot with the aging. Uh, this, this presentation is more into the short-term stability, which is a temperature stability, uh, what we call the, the, you know, the resonator. Okay. In order to get an oscillator stable, you need to be able to control its frequency. In order to control the frequency, you need to be able to tune the frequency of oscillator, right? Now, what are the ways that we can control the oscillator frequency? You can, uh, oscillator has one amplifier or multiple amplifiers and one resonating tank. So obviously what you need to do is you need to tune the resonance frequency of that uh, resonating tank. And that's, this is what we're talking about here. The resonator in question that we talked about has a series LC model. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of why we got this LC model. Uh, I have, uh, I would be happy to discuss that later. Uh, but if you do have this design, because of the type of, uh, the type of system, you have some parasitics. Imagine that here there is a substrate. And if this is a substrate, then you will have a parasitic to that substrate. So this parasitic is going to be problematic. May not be problematic at very low frequencies, but it is going to be problematic at high frequency. There are two types of tunings. You can either put a tunable uh, element. Here we are using a capacitor 
which is a lot easier and is CMOS friendly. Some other people might actually try to tune out this inductor using different techniques, but let's say we're using it faster. You can put this either in series or you can put this in parallel, right? Um, this capacitance, which I just talked about, and this comes mostly from the parasitic, uh, it has an impact on the resonance frequency, but it, it's a second order impact, right? It's true that if you change this capacitor, you can actually change the frequency of the oscillation. But that is usually going to affect the quality factor, and uh, the higher this capacitance, the, the more power you have to burn in your amplifier to actually get the oscillation sustained. On the other hand, if you use a series tuning, that might be more difficult to design, but you will be able to directly change the resonance frequency without affecting the quality factor. Why is series tuning harder? Um, it's because when you have the capacitance here, there is a capacitive division. So your effective capacitance seen by this cap, which is going to be in series with it, is going to be smaller. So the effective uh, capacitance change is going to be smaller. By that, if you look at these graphs, uh, you can see that if I vary the capacitance, this is the shunt parasitic capacitance to ground. When I vary this capacitance for a different quality factor, which translates into different capacitance, motional capacitance, I get uh, diminished return on my tuning range. These are the tuning range in the PPM uh, from the resonance frequency. If I ideally don't have uh, any capacitance, I can have uh, you know two series capacitance, one of them is motional capacitance, the other one is the tuning cap. But when I put the parasitic, this quickly drops to levels that's not acceptable and it's not good for our um, uh, eventual goal of temperature compensation. I have looked at multiple scenarios uh, and this shows that multiple factors, no matter if you change the resistance or meaning the loss of the resonator or the quality factor of the resonator, these are all converged on the very low values and it's not acceptable. So what do we do? Obviously you need to get rid of it, right? Uh, this was a basic circuit. As long as this is there is a simple physics that there is going to be a uh, capacitive uh, division here. So there are m multiple ways to uh, neutralize this capacitance. You can have a, an inductor to resonate this out. This inductor can be a passive inductor. It could be an active inductor. There are multiple ways to do it. Um, or you can actually have a negative capacitor added here and then try to partially neutralize this capacitance. Or if you have a very high Q design, you can get rid of all of it. We chose the second approach, a negative capacitor. Why? Because a negative capacitor is a more broadband approach. For an active inductor design, you're only going to resonate this out over a very short uh, uh, frequency range. If you're going to get larger tuning, then this becomes a problem because your, your, your um, neutralization approach will only work at a certain range. Uh, negative capacitor, which I'm showing here, is broadband. So this is a single transistor, I'm sorry, two transistor negative capacitor. It's a single terminal. I can apply that the input. Then this capacitance uh, uh, is going to get uh, converted. This is a type of negative impedance converter. is going to get converted to an, a negative capacitor at this, and it's going at, at the input node, and it's going to be in parallel with the capacitor of a resonator, OK? This is a conceptual design, a prototype we did. We did not want it to push the boundaries of frequency for this pr prototype. So if you, you see that the design of the TIA and all of the amplifiers are pretty simple. Um, for this prototype, we chose a 400 megahertz oscillator. Uh, and I compared all of them, all of the approaches. If I don't have any compensation, I barely have 80 ppm of tuning across the range. I'm changing all of my tuning range, going all the way through uh, 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 max range of the reactor. If I use an active tuning, uh, I get 350 ppm. And if I use negative capacitor, I was able to get almost 800 ppm. We further did another work, which was in, our, uh, in, in the journal. You can see that that was another 500 megahertz work. And we got a 1,500 ppm out of it. This seems to be on the borderline to get some temperature conversation done. Uh, but before doing that, let's look at the phase noise. If I'm doing a temperature conversation, meaning if I'm doing a T 
tuning for temperature conversation and my phase noise is not good, then um, I have to go back to scratch and start over because the ultimate performance metric for, for an oscillator, which I want to emphasize, is the phase noise or jitter. Now, we studied this uh, at low frequency, a low offset frequency, that's what we are interested in because all the uh, high carrier frequency is going to get cleaned out in the PLL. Uh, the PLL nature uh, is um, from an input signal, a reference is going to look like a low pass filter. So it's going to clean out all of these. Uh, the low frequency side, the variation was less than 4 dB, and this was acceptable across all the range for us. Uh, with having this design, we were able to create another loop for temperature compensation. That works in a sense with having a, you know, a, an on-chip temperature sensor based on a band gap based and then some uh, parabolic voltage uh, uh, function generator and applying this signal to the uh, tunable cap. And the reason we use parabolic because, <coughs> excuse me, we want it to be, <coughs> excuse me, we want it to be more precise in determining the frequency behavior of the resonator. Usually that's not linear. Um, so. Having said that, almost 1,000 ppm uh, drift turned out uh, was reduced to just 70 ppm across the industrial range from minus 10 um, degrees to 70 degrees. And uh, this is uh, this was a, uh, this is a almost 30 times improvement from an uncompensated design with no impact on the phase noise. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now. Now let's look at a totally different paradigm. We talked about the high performance design and, and two of the main challenges. Now let's look at the low power design. As I said, IoT is going to encompass all the devices. Some of these applications need a very low power um, interface, analog or radio frequency uh, circuit. Um, one of the prime examples is the medical applications, okay? People like to call that Internet of medical things. This is basically biosensors, uh, which are the key to remote medical sensing. Okay, these require, uh, and they're pretty much everywhere. They're in remote diagnosis, surgery. They're in connected medical devices. Uh, they are health monitoring. You can look at your, you know, watches that can have this this kind of capability, and of course the uh, smart sensors. Um, they all have one thing in common. They need very low power electronics. A very low power smart electronics because uh, they need to be able to not only give them commands at low power but also need to adjust the performance. Currently, the state of the art is if you consider a system, most of the power is being burned in the radio. And that is because just the frequency of operation is high and in compared to the other parts and that's why in order to get this design working with the current standard uh, processes, IC processes, you have to burn more power. I'm showing on the right the, the communication subsystem is almost burning 60 percent. That is a problem, right? It has to go down. Um, so we need to come up with some low power techniques. These are mostly have to be around high speed analog or RF to address this problem, okay? On the left side, you will see the rest of the system, which is mostly digital or sensors. There are other solutions for them. Just for the digital, you can imagine that going to a different node is going to help you with reducing the power consumption because your parasitic is going to go down. But that's not the case for analog, right? That brings us to low power circuits and systems. Um, OK, there are multiple ways of doing designs for low power systems. but First things first, you need to actually look at your architecture, okay? Here I'm showing an architecture for a receiver, and this design is very low power. Another colleague of mine did it. Uh, and this design is actually burning almost no power in the front end, right? It's just a transformer and then mixer. The only power is being burned on the LO, LO right? Um, this is one design. You can keep that in mind. The problem with it is, it's going to have high noise. You have no application in the, in the front end, so all of these noises are going to refer back to the input. And it's going to get magnified because you have some uh, loss, right? But at the same time, it's very linear, right? Another solution which we thought of is uh, why not try to reuse the current in multiple stages coming from one supply? So we did this work uh, 
for, for multiple variations of this work, but in this design, we have all the traditional components of a receiver. We have an amplifier, we call it low noise amplifier. We have even a mixer, or we have a, a VCO, but all, all, the current from supply is being reused in all of them. So effectively, we're just drawing the current of the VCO, whatever that is. And we have our own clever filtering to make sure that uh, no coupling happens or no uh, leakage is from one, uh, let's say, VCO to the mixer and vice versa, right? Okay. In traditional CMOS, that's what we are using mostly these days. If you apply these kind of technologies, what you end up getting is you're going to hurt the voltage headroom, right? The voltage headroom is critical because not only you need linearity, but you also need to get your devices working at the, re uh, at the region of operation that you want, right? Okay, for low power devices, sensors, the power that you're getting uh, or receiving at the receiver and the power that's being transmitted by the transmitter, both of them are very low. So likely, you're not gonna hit the linearity limits, okay? So um, this, is, this was one of our concerns when we started this work, but it turned out that in most of the applications, for example, for body area networks, the power is really low. Even for Bluetooth low energy, the power is really low. So that's not a concern. But the voltage headroom for, for these devices, we currently do CMOS, even if you do other type of designs, this is still a concern. In order to get the design working su successfully in CMOS, uh, we had to change the region of operation. We had to move from um, saturation to uh, sub-threshold, meaning that we move from strong inversion to weak inversion. Um, if you look at your textbook, you think, oh, okay, if I work in this region, I don't have enough bandwidth, I don't have enough transconductance, and nothing is gonna work at RF. But with the performance improvement in the processes these days, it is now possible to actually get sub-threshold ultra-low power designs with one or two orders of magnitude lower power uh, operating at the frequency of interest in multi-gigahertz. If you look at this uh, sub-threshold design, um, the good thing about it is that it's actually uh, uh, the gain of the transconductance is exponential. Uh, meaning that if you apply a little bit of a voltage, uh, the current will go up exponentially as opposed to the square law in the strong inversion regime. For a simple LNA, uh, we can simply apply a different voltage and put this device in, um, in sub-threshold and look at its gain. Okay, we looked at the gain. This is a design and strong inversion here and this is a design in sub-threshold here, a decade apart. And these are contours of gain. When you have a, a, a GM over ID of you know, a certain fixed value, okay, the, this is a normalized GM with the current, um, it turned out that we can get very high gains. Even from a simple design, we were able to get almost 30 dB of gain if we wanted to. Of course, we didn't choose 30 dB, but we could get a uh, very large gain uh, with less current, 10x lower current. At the same time, the noise performance was not that bad. The noise got hit because obviously the noise is not just a fa function of the uh, GM, there's also a function of the bandwidth uh, and FT of the device, uh, but we were able to stay within the one dB of the best we could achieve with six milliamps, uh, which is 10x higher than the current consumption that we are having in, in this design. So. If you optimize your device properly, and if you stack them, then you're potentially able to have a very low power transceiver, okay? And this was done this way. Okay, so you have a low noise amplifier, right? We use this work for, our, for a product um, in, in Qualcomm, so we wanted to make sure that we get, uh, you know, a good, uh, uh, linearity as well as we wanted to reduce all of the IQ mismatches, the problems that we had, so we use the uh, differential design. In a differential design, we can have another stage which does the single net to differential conversion for you. Uh, we chose to stack them on top. This is our stacking topology. This LNA, which is shown here, has two parts. This is the LNA section, and this is the single net to differential section. In less than 400 microwatt, 
we were able to get 30 dB of gain and noise figure of about 3 dB, which is, I believe is, is the best in this process, the 40 nanometer process that we did. This is a prototype of the just the LNA chip we did. And this is the performance. You can see gain, noise figure, and relatively good matching at the frequency of interest. This work was done for Bluetooth low energy, so everything is centered around 2.4 gigahertz. Armed with this data, we now designed a full transceiver. A full transceiver has a low noise amplifier with a stacked STD uh, and the entire chain going into the system, the base fan side, uh, the mixer, uh, you know, the entire PLL, all of these things was done. Uh, and uh, we published this in CICC. The chip you can see here is on the left uh, side on the bottom. Uh, the performance was very good. We were actually able to get close to minus 96 dBm of sensitivity at less than one milliwatt. I think this is a record we have so far. The only thing missing from this design is that uh, the A2D is still not on chip. Uh, but if you look at, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the ATD work done by uh, Boris Mormon at Stanford, you can see that at these kind of rates, we can probably get away with 30, 40 microwatts having two ADCs. So we can still have a milliwatt design, uh, the entire receiver. Uh, and this is just compared with other people's work. And uh, yeah, this is astonishing improvement in figure of merit compared to others over 5 dB. Uh, um, okay. What can be done? Uh, we can apply the same concept to the transmitter, right? We talked about the receiver having, um, using stacking or currently using topology. You can do the same thing for the transmitter, right? The transmitters have multiple stages. Some of these stages are not actually uh, used for getting uh, power gain. They're used so-called to get voltage gain. Uh, the output stage usually is critical, so that is going to determine the current consumption. You can reuse some of this current into your driver or other stages that you have, and at the same time have an adaptive power control. This work we've done is not yet published, but we were able to get uh, efficiencies uh, at really low power boosted to 40%. At like minus 10 dBm, we had 40% efficiency, which was really good because we can control this power, we can reduce this, we can reuse some of these supplies. So our design is practically just a fraction of this. Okay. 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 Uh, so this is, this, this is a, a more big picture. Now that you have the receiver, you can have, you can actually uh, interface that with a sensor system integrated entirely on one chip. This could really be drastically lower power. The design that we did was for a Bluetooth low energy, one megabit per second product. This could be even sub-microwatt. I can reduce the power consumption of these blocks by two orders of magnitude and they would still work. Uh, this is just for sensor readout. The output could be uh, kilobit per second. There's a lot of interest by agencies in this. You know, I've, I've, I've seen NSF has a smart uh, connected uh, cities program. And then the ARPA BTO has got very interested in these kind of works. These, these sensors can be very agile. And to make things even more exciting, uh, you can look at the advancement that's going to happen to, to IoT. This is the massive IoT that I was talking about. It's got everything, right? But if you just look at the smart portion of it, it is actually the portion that has to do with a lot with the sensors, low power sensors, uh, communication with, uh, you know, Sent, uh, small devices like portable devices. Th these are really low power and smart communications, okay? But there's a missing link and that is cognitive thinking into this. So you have to add some algorithms to actually bridge this gap. There is no, uh, there's no so-called, you know, intelligent functionality built in. This is just still waiting to get the, uh, response uh, or waiting to get the command from, from the CPU. Uh, you can apply this concept to the previous design and you can have uh, loops to have data taken at the sensors and you can have your analysis on chip. You can do your learning and training on chip. You can apply that to the sensor. You can actually change the behavior of the sensor. This could be a different sensor. You actually save sensors on nodes. So your 37 billion devices might end up being 37 million devices because a lot of these devices are not 
multiple purpose. They do different things. They adapt to the environment. Or you can still have connections from outside to it. I think this is more of a vision uh, that we, uh, we are going to evolve to. But uh, it's not going to replace the fact that we need to have a platform. This is what you are currently getting from IoT systems uh, from companies. There are multiple modules, sensors, accelerometers, you know, radios. You see this is a bulky chip. Uh, but uh, as we talk, there are like m multiple areas that uh, not only we have to worry about for the integration, we also need to improve the performance, right? They all come back to have a standard platform. And this is the platform that I believe is going to be, at the end, uh, useful for all of us. It's, it's going to have smart sensors. It's going to have, you know, uh, it's going to be very low power because a lot of the interfaces are gone. It's going to be AI enabled. You can have, uh, you know, neural processors designed here. This is a big chip. It could be everything. You will have silicon photonics. You'll have biosensors. You'll have MEMS. You have everything on it. And I believe this is going to be something that's going to uh, revolutionize the IoT in the next few years. So I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, both at Qualcomm, Broadcom, which was a while ago before, and then Georgia Tech. Uh, we got a lot of funding from, uh, from agencies, DARPA and NSF in particular. And I had colleagues who did a lot of work in clean room helping me. Uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer questions. Can you speak up, please? With regard to uh, the stack in the block, if uh, you collect all the current, is there some constraint in giving you some sort of consistency in terms of why you need to parallel the sensor? OK. Yes. Um, let's go back to that slide. Um, some of these devices. Um, Uh, some of these designs, uh, they still have at least one transistor, and that one particular transistor has to work, so that's the limitation that you can have. So you cannot actually reduce the supply more because you need to get at least one of the devices working. Uh, that pretty much sets how many, uh, the limit of how many parallel designs you can have. If you can look at this design, we actually did a mix and match. We you chose to do partially the idea that you said they're you know, parallel devices, but they're all coming from the same supply because there's limitation on how low you can go in the supply. You can't go all of a sudden to zero volts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see it. I saw him for ten minutes. Hahaha. Who put? I enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Did you get it? 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 Did you get من می رفتم پایین به دوباره می مدم بالا مثلا یه چیز دیگر اونجوری چیز می کردم من کم فورت می رفتم که مردم فوکس رو لوز نکنن این دیپ دایو بشن ایکویشن بنویسیم و یهو میگن چی شد کجا بودیم مثلا مثلا سعی کردم حالا دیگه نمیدونم دیگه سلام خواهش می کنم حسین اکسپیکتی من فکوتی جای دانشگاه هستم سلامتی من با هم کوآتور پیتر ماکرو آره شما شما چیز بودی شما فکر می کنم که شما پوستا که اینجا بودین یه مدتی ها بله 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 از اونجا من نشون با یو بی سی با چیز می‌کردین همین پیپر بله 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 همین همین کاری که الان جون نشون دادم آره همون موقع بود که امیر حسین اومده بود اینترن ما بود مسندی نمیدونم میشناسیشون ایشون بعد 
بعد این کارا رو کردیم یه سری از این کارهایی که من نشون دادم کار با این تجربه با اینا کردیم okay. پس این رفت یه قسمتش رفت توی پروداکت اون کار اول نه همش بعد یه قسمتش رفت توی پروداکت آره باشه باشه آقا بذار صحبت می‌کنیم بیدم باشتم مخواست نیم کنم بیت زنی می‌زم آره نه نه هستم اوکی چون تازه شوی کردی؟ آه جیس کی می‌سکن؟ Let's take this out.